Welcome to our ongoing series of videos on structural analysis from chapter 3 in the book. We're on our fourth video from section 2, so this is 03.2-D and the topic is determining reactions uh, for the support structure under structural elements. So what is a reaction? Supports or constraints are elements that provide whatever force or moment that are required to keep a structure in equilibrium under the forces to which it is subjected, those forces being called loads, which we studied in Chapter 2. These supports react to the loads in such a way as to maintain equilibrium of the structure. We refer to the forces provided by the supports as reactions meaning they are reacting to whatever the applied forces are, which may be variable because they may be shifting live loads, wind loads, seismic effects, snow loads, etc. So in a previous section on equilibrium, we said that there, we're going to deal with planar force systems. In other words, we will deal with horizontal forces, which we will designate in the X direction vertical forces, which we're going to designate in the y direction, and then moments that are produced by these forces, and those moments are inherently about some sort of z-axis, and we always understand that to be the case, so we just say some of the moments, and we're going to calculate them around a point rather than an axis, because the axis will go through a point in the plane, and that point will be the, the part of the axis about which we calculate the moments. So, in terms of solving for reactions, we're going to say the principle of action-reaction pairs is crucial in addition to the principles of equilibrium. And the principle of action-reaction pairs is the following. When object A exerts a force on object B, object B exerts an equal and opposite force on object A. This also applies to the pressure or stress distribution at the interface between the two objects, meaning that for every tiny patch of area, the two forces on those two interacting patches on the two different objects are equal. So for example, when you walk on the floor, um, the pressure distribution on the bottom of your foot is the exact mirror image of the pressure distribution that your foot is producing on the floor. So if there are points of high pressure on the bottom of the foot, then those are also points of high pressure on the floor. And as you might imagine, if you wanted to take an extreme example of this, a woman ha walking in a high heel shoe will have an area distributed force under the ball of her foot which is moderate and then an extremely high pressure on the bottom of her heel and the that extreme high pressure on the upward pressure on the bottom of her heel will mirror the extremely high downward pressure of the heel on the floor. So whatever that distribution is at every single point at the interface between the two objects the pressure of object A on B is equal to the pressure, equal in magnitude, to the pressure of object B on A, except they are opposite in direction. Also, by extension, when object A exerts a moment on object B, object B exerts an equal and opposite moment on object A. So equilibrium, which says the sum of all the X forces on an object is zero, the sum of all the y objects on a z forces on an object are zero, and the sum of all the moments on an object is zero. That combined with the principle of action-reaction pairs, which is when object A exerts a force on object B, object B exerts an equal and opposite force on object A. These are the primary principles that we're going to use to do structural analysis in this course. So let's take an example. We have a beam which is supported at each end. And on the left end, it has a pin joint support and on the right end, a roller joint support. And the distinction between those two is not particularly crucial. 
in the case of this particular beam because there's a two kip vertical force that's applied. There's no horizontal force that's applied. So we could have two reactions at the left end of this beam, a uh, vertical reaction and a horizontal reaction, but the hor horizontal reaction will not be very interesting. But we're going to resolve it nonetheless. The support at the end, the left end, is a pin joint. It's a two force support. It's capable of producing both a vertical component, which we're calling AY, and a horizontal component that we're calling AX. So that would be this force and that force are the resolved forces from this support. So when we see this support, we understand this is an abstract representation of a two-force system, which involves AX and AY. The roller joint on the other end is purely capable of generating a vertical force. It cannot generate a horizontal force, so we represent that vertical reaction as BY. One of the things you'll notice here is we have a cross uh, line here. Um, and we usually use that as a symbol of a reactive force. So we're distinguishing it from this, which is an applied force. This is a reactive force, which has this mark. And this mark is sort of a, a sort of graphic carryover that in the old days we used to draw a line along here, which was a dimension line and we'd show what the length was and we'd run it from this cross piece to that cross, this cross line to that cross line. Now we use that cross line as a symbol of reaction instead. Um, and, and it's not obvious that that would be the case. So we have to understand how that sort of evolved into current practice. In my nomenclature, I don't even use that form of dimensioning because now I don't want to get confused in our structural studies about the meaning of this cross line. <coughs> so I'm using standard arrows here to represent dimensions. This is a beam with an overall length of 18 feet and the two kip force is six feet from the right end of the beam. So now we want to apply principles of equilibrium to this beam. And you will discover, by the way, that I frequently begin by applying the moment equation. And that's because it's an extremely versatile equation, which allows me to solve for a lot of different things. Each time I take moments about a different point, I'm potentially capable of solving for something different. So, for example, in my first application of the principles of equilibrium, I'm going to take the sum of the moments about end A, which is this end right here. And I'm picking that point because... So, the question becomes, why are we taking moments about the end A? And the answer is, we would always like to choose a point about which to take moments where we eliminate as many unknowns as possible. That will allow us to reduce down the number of un unknowns and as quickly as possible converge on some answers. So in this case, I have two unknowns around the left end, AX and AY. And uh, both those forces go through the center point of the left end. So when I take moments about the end A, I get A sub X times a lever arm of zero because that's the point about which I'm taking moments and the force goes through it, plus A sub Y times a lever arm of zero feet. So in other words, A sub X is multiplied by zero and A sub Y is multiplied by zero and as a consequence, A sub X and A sub Y both disappear from this equation. Continuing on, I have a two kip force, which is tending to create a clockwise moment around the left end because it's tending to produce rotation in a clockwise direction. So clockwise means I attach a plus sign to it. I multiply the two kip force, which is the magnitude of the force, times the lever arm, which is the perpendicular distance from the line of action of this two kip force 
to the point about which I'm taking moments, which in this case, we're told that this two kip force is 12 feet away from the left end. So the lever arm or the perpendicular distance for that force around point A is 12 feet. So I have two kips times 12 feet with a plus sign in front. And then the final force that I have to account for is BY. It's tending to produce counterclockwise motion about the left end or point A. So I put minus BY, which is the magnitude of the force, times the lever arm, which is 18 feet from the line of action of force BY to the point A about which we're taking moments. And we have now accounted for all four forces, AX, AY, two kips, and BY, in, in our moment equation, and the sum of all those moments has to be equal to zero. So this term goes to zero, that term goes to zero. So we have plus two kips times 12 feet minus BY times 18 feet. When we take BY over to the other side of the equation and then flip the equation around, we get plus BY times 18 feet is equal to plus two kips times 12 feet. Or in other words, BY times 18, because this foot cancels out with that one. We have BY times 18 is equal to two kips times 12. Or in other words, we get, we bring 18 down under 12 over 18 is two thirds. Two thirds times two kips is 1.33 kips. And all this ends up plus. And the meaning of that plus sign, by the way, this is really, really important. So listen carefully. We've got lots of conventions about plus and minus signs. For example, up here, we put a plus sign because we're, we're designating a moment here. And the plus sign means it's a clockwise moment. Here we had a minus, which means a counterclockwise moment. When we get to the end, end here, we're going to have a plus or a minus sign. If we have a plus sign at this juncture, it doesn't have to do with moments anymore. It has to do with this force BY. And a plus sign here means, yes, BY was in the direction we assumed it was. And this positive force is a confirmation of that fact. So we assumed BY was an upward force. And when we go through all this mathematics, we get a plus sign. And that plus sign says, yes, that is actually an upward force as we drew it. If we'd gotten a minus sign, that would have meant we drew this force in the wrong direction originally. And we should then write up here, BY equals minus 1.333. And then we would forever interpret that to mean we need to flip this arrow in our minds. But we don't have to do that because in this particular example, this is an upward force. And we intuitively know that's the case. If we got this force in between, we know somehow it's shared between this upward force and that upward force. We intuitively know that. There will be situations where we don't know the answer beforehand though. We don't know whether a force is up or down. And the beauty to our mathematical system is we can just make an assumption. Like for example, we can always draw all our reactive forces as upward, whether we know whether they're upward or not. And then when we get a minus sign, that will simply say that actually, that vertical force was actually down. And this is the way it's done in computers. Computers don't try to figure these things out beforehand. They just set in motion the mathematical machinery and the mathematical machinery comes back and tells you the answer. So in the tabular data from the computer, you'll get all kinds of plus and minus forces and you will understand if it's a vertical force, minus means it's downward, plus means it's upward. All right, now we can take the sum of the moments about NB, which is this end right here. When we do that, we discover that AX, if we extend its line of action, it goes through point B. So AX has a lever arm of zero feet about point B, which is the right end of this beam. AY is tending to create a clockwise moment around the end of this beam. It's tending to do this. 
So we put a plus sign times Ay, which is the magnitude of this reaction, times 18 feet, which is the lever arm between the line of action of the force Ay and the right end of this beam, which is point B. Ay plus Ay times 18 feet is the moment of this reaction about this point B. Then the two kip force is tending to produce a counterclockwise moment about that point. So we put minus for counterclockwise, two kips for the magnitude of the force, six feet for the lever arm or the perpendicular distance from the line of action of the two kip force to the point B about which we're calculating moments. And then finally, this last one is BY times the lever arm is zero feet. We don't care whether we call it plus or minus because it has a lever arm of zero and therefore is a zero moment and the sign is no longer important but we put in plus just so we understand we're adding plus zero so we have zero from that we have zero from that that leaves us with minus two kips times six feet plus a y times 18 feet is equal to zero and when we solve for this we can take that over to the other side of the equation and change the sign. And we go through this division and we end up with Ay is equal to 2 kips times 6 eighteenths or 1 third, which is 0.6667 kips. Again, it's a plus sign, which means Ay is a positive quantity, meaning yes, it is in the original direction that we drew it in. Now, uh, the last thing that we can solve for here, which could have been the first thing, is a x clearly is zero when we sum all the horizontal forces. It's the only horizontal force. It has to be zero. So the reaction Ax is equal to zero. And then finally, we have a check on this. Um, and it's a very simple check. If we take our value for Ay, which is 0.6667 kips, and the value we got for by, which was 1.33333 kips, we add those two vertical forces, we get two kips of upward force from Ay and By, we have two kips of downward force from the applied force, and those um, equilibrate each other, cancel each other out, which leaves us with a, a net zero vertical force, which says that we have a check we've used our sum of the vertical forces as a check to make sure that our answers make sense. Now, most people will start with the vertical force, but if you do that, you end up with Ay and By. You can't resolve them in one equation, so you have to go find information somewhere else. So that's why I just begin always with the moment equations. I get as much information as I can out of the moment equations, and then I use my vertical force equation as the check. You will always have a check. And the, the dumbest thing you can possibly do is fail to use that check. So in this case, we had more equations than we needed. We used the moment about the, the left end to get By. We used the moment around the right end to get Ay. And then we used the sum of the verticals equation to check that our values are correct. If you have an equation that allows you to check you and you don't do it, you deserve whatever happens to you because when you make a mistake, you won't know that you made the mistake because you didn't use your check. Okay, so here's another uh, simple kind of situation. We've got a pin joint at the left end, six feet in from the right end. We've got a roller joint. We have a continuous load W, which would be in kips per foot or pounds per foot. In this case, though, we're just keeping it in symbolic for form of lowercase w. And that's a perfectly legitimate way to do it. And then we don't bother multiplying in the value of w until we get to the end of the problem. And we often find it useful to keep things in this abstract form where it's just um, some unknown W and all of our equations that we get in the end will be expressed in terms of W 
and then if W changes, we can substitute that in really quickly. So, um, we would like, so what we did here, by the way, is we took these symbolic representations of a pin joint and we represented the two force components that a pin joint like that could produce. And here we put the, the vector force that a roller joint, such as support B, could, be, could produce. So our first step here is to resolve or to re-express these uh, symbolic supports with more detailed information about what those supports do. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to replace W with a point force that represents the equivalent of that. Now that point force will be limited in its applicability. For example, right now we're looking at the entire beam and if we want to understand equilibrium of the entire beam and we want to understand something about these reactive forces, we can replace W with an equivalent point force. The key thing is that equivalent of point force only applies when we're talking about the entire beam. As soon as we take a subset of the beam, uh, we need a different point force. So we need to understand that point force is not really telling us detailed information about what's happening internally in this beam. It's not telling us about any subset of the beam. It's just allowing us to solve for the reactions AY and BY. So if we have a uniformly distributed load like this, we intuitively understand that there is a single equilibrium force at the geometric center of this distributed load, which will equilibrate it. And we can test this, by the way. You can go get a yardstick that has a very uniform cross section and a uniform material density. And if you put your finger at the center of it and support it there, you'll discover that you not only support it, but it's balanced on top of your finger. So you know somehow from an equilibrium point of view, there's a single force that equilibrates that distributed load W. And therefore, by deductive reasoning, you can say we can replace that W with an equivalent point force, which will properly represent it in terms of the equilibrium of this free body. Okay, so um, if we started off and we said, well, we got 1.5 kips per foot and we want to replace W with a point force, the length of this beam is 18 feet. So 18 feet times 1.5 kips per foot is a total of 26 kips of downward force. That, excuse me, 27 kips of downward force. And that 27 kips is at the geometric center of this beam. So in other words, it's nine feet in from the right end and nine feet in from the left end. So keeping all this dimensional information that locates B, Y, and locates this 27 kips is really crucial to making sure that we do the analysis correctly. So we redraw that free body and now we do the sum of the moments about the left end A. Again, we have AX times zero feet, AY times zero feet as a lever arm because both those forces go through end A. Then we have 27 kips tending to cause a clockwise moment about end A. So we put a plus sign to designate a positive or clockwise moment. The magnitude of the force is 27 kips. The perpendicular distance from point A to the line of action of the 27 kip force is nine feet. So we have plus 27 kips times nine feet. BY now is tending to produce a counterclockwise moment about the left end, A. So we put a minus sign times BY, which is the magnitude of the force, times the lever arm, or the perpendicular distance, from the line of action of BY to point A, about which we're calculating moments, and that distance is 12 feet. So we have 
a counterclockwise moment of magnitude by times 12 feet and that takes account of all four forces ax ay uh, 27 kips and by and so that's all the external moments on this object and they all have to add up to zero this term is zero that term is zero so we end up with 27 kips times 9 feet minus by times 12 feet when we take by over to the other side of the equation and then we flip the equation back we get by times 12 feet is equal to 2 kips times 9 feet the minus sign disappears when we take that term over to the other side so we go through this arithmetic and we get 9 twelfths of 27 kips or 20.25 kips for by and now when we take the sum of the moments about point B, again, AX, the line of action goes all the way to the right end, right through point B. So AX has a lever arm of zero feet. AY has a lever arm, excuse me, I'm taking this about point B, which is right here. It's not the right end, it's about point B. And I picked point B right there because I want by to disappear from the equation. In other words, I got by times a lever arm of zero feet. My point is still correct when I, ex when I extend the line of action of AX. It goes through point B also. So its lever arm is zero. So when I picked this point right here, I eliminated AX and by from my equation because they both go through that point they both have zero lever arm relative to that point. And when we multiply in the zero lever arm, the terms that involve AX and BY disappear. But now I got to calculate the moment of AY. AY is tending to create a counter counterclockwise rotation about point B. So we put a plus sign times the magnitude AY times its lever arm, which is 12 feet. That's the perpendicular distance from the line of action of force AY to the point B about which we are calculating moments. So we have plus AY times 12 feet. And then finally, we have the 27 kip force is tending to produce a counterclockwise moment about point B. So we put a minus sign for a counterclockwise moment. 27 kips is the magnitude of the force. And the lever arm between the point B and the line of action of this 27 kip force is 12 minus 9 feet. So I didn't do that right. No, excuse me. I did do it right. I took this distance and subtracted off that distance, which gives me this lever arm which is three feet. So it's minus 27 kips times this lever arm, which is nine feet minus six feet. And so my equation now becomes AY times 12 feet minus 27 kips times three feet because nine minus six is three feet. I take the negative 27 kips times three feet over to the other side. It becomes plus. So I have AY times 12 feet is plus 27 kips times 3 feet. I cancel a foot out on each side, which leaves me AY times 12 is equal to 27 kips times 3. And then when I divide through by 12, I get 27 kips times 3 twelfths or 1 quarter, which is 6.75. And now I can use the sum of my verticals equation, where AY is 6.75 and by was 20.25 and when I add those two together I get 27 kips of upward force which just equilibrates the 27 kips of downward force so my sum of the verticals equation verifies that the reactions that I deduce based on my moment equations are correct and those reactions are ay is plus 6.75 kips by is plus 20.25 kips in both cases I got a plus sign 
And that plus sign, I remind you, means, yes, the direction in which the arrows were drawn and upon which we generated the mathematics, th those directions were correct. And the mathematics are saying, yes, the arrows were drawn in the right direction. It's not a problem if they were drawn in the wrong direction. You just draw up there a negative number to represent that force. Okay, we have a third and last reaction problem that we're going to solve. Here we have the classic moment connection at the left end. We have a 10 kip force on the right end. And by the way, this is our classic 3, 4, 5. So this is our classic 3, 4, 5 right triangle. So uh, by proportions, if this is 10 kips, that's 10 is twice 5, so we would have twice 4 over here, or twice 3 there. So we can now resolve that force into an 8 kip force and a 6 kip horizontal force. And likewise, we can resolve this symbol into its effects, which are a horizontal force AX, a vertical force AY, and a moment. Now, uh, we are going to have a convention that when we're looking at the left end of a member like this, we're going to draw AX in the positive direction, in other words, to the right. We're going to draw AY in the positive direction, meaning up. And we're going to draw M in the positive direction, meaning clockwise. We just do that arbitrarily and we don't even think. Um, if you're thinking here, you're probably thinking M is in the opposite direction. So why is he doing that? Um, and the answer is because there are situations where we don't know the answer beforehand and we don't want to be paralyzed sitting there trying to figure out the answer. We want to let our mathematics work for us. We've got this beautiful mathematical machinery. We don't actually have to think. All we have to do is say, here are our starting assumptions and let the mathematics tell us. And we're less likely to make mistakes if we're always consistent. In other words, we always choose whatever our positive convention is. So I drew M in the clockwise direction, meaning it's positive. And we're going to run the mathematics and we're going to see if it's positive. Okay, so the first thing we notice is when we sum the horizontals, AX has got to equal plus six kips because there is this six kip force to the left. This has to be a six kip force to the right. So by inspection, we're just going to say it's plus six kips, meaning yes, it's in the direction we drew it in and its magnitude is six kips. Um, we can also sum all the verticals and say AY is plus eight kips. Uh, it has to be up because it's trying to equilibrate this downward force. Um, and so we say, well, and we drew it up. So we're going to say plus, meaning yes, it's in the appropriate direction. And it's of magnitude eight kips. Life gets more interesting now because we want to apply the equations of equilibrium to figure out what M is. And it turns out we can sum moments about a lot of different points here. Um, since AX and AY were both unknowns, we might choose to take moments about that end just in case we made some mistake in calculating AX and AY. That, those mistakes wouldn't contaminate the current calculation because we'll get rid of AX. We'll eliminate them from the equation because they'll have zero lever arm. But we could just as easily take moments about the right end or anywhere along this. And in fact, we could take it about any point in the universe for the following reason. First of all, the two six kip forces produce no moment. Here we have an eight kip force and an eight kip force. So these two things represent a force couple, which is a pure moment. And we said that pure moment is the same about any point in the universe. And likewise, this moment, by definition, is a pure moment. And its moment about any point in the universe is the same. So we could pick any point in the universe 
and solve this problem. But we're just going to randomly pick point A and we're going to crunch the numbers and see what happens. So AX goes through point A so it has zero lever arm. A Y goes through point A so it has zero lever arm. We then have an eight kip force which is tending to produce clockwise motion about point A. So we say plus for clockwise. Eight kips is the magnitude of the force. The perpendicular distance from the line of action of this eight kip force to the moment to the point A about which we're calculating moments is just the length of this beam, which is 20 feet. So we have plus eight kips times 20 feet is the moment of this eight kip force about point A. And finally, moment M is the same about all points in the universe. Um, and its magnitude or effect is we're representing with the symbol M. And we're going to put a plus sign because we originally drew it in the positive direction uh, to make it clockwise. So we put plus M equals zero. And now when we go through and we solve, we see that uh, when we take this 8 kip times 20 feet over to the other side, it becomes negative, And the moment then becomes minus 160 kip feet. Now that minus sign means that the actual moment is in the opposite direction to the one we originally chose. We didn't have to figure that out beforehand. The mathematics is telling us that. So our by our nomenclature, it's a negative moment with tension along the top of the beam and compression along the bottom of the beam. And, but we will go right. M is equal to minus 160 kip feet. Now, here's one of the biggest mistakes you can possibly make. Some of you are obsessive about the notion that an arrow has to be in the actual direction of whatever that effect is. So you will want to redraw this moment in the opposite direction. And you can do that. What it means though is you'll have to redo the mathematics. So you'll have to go into this equation. First you'll have to draw the curly arrow in the opposite direction. Then you'll have to put a minus sign there. And then when you work through all the mathematics it'll end up being plus, which means yes it's in the direction that it was originally indicated, as opposed to right now it's saying no, it's in the opposite direction. But you need to make your mathematics and whatever that arrow is consistent. Otherwise, you have to get to the end and summarize the results by saying M is equal to minus 160 kips. The best thing you can do is not waste your time redrawing that arrow. You can just leave that moment the way it is and right beside it, it's equal to minus 160 kip feet, which will be taken to mean it's actually counterclockwise and it's opposite to the direction that was originally drawn. It's the way it's done in all computer programs and it's the way it's done in any logical accounting system. You set up a simple, really consistent convention for your accounting system and you never deviate from it. Otherwise your accounting system will drive you crazy because you won't know what it's doing for you. Okay, that ends our um, fourth video from section two of chapter three, uh, which is dealing with reactions.